morning, Crossroads Church, and we're uh, glad to be here this morning. Welcome to you that are in the, in the room and those that are online. Um, man, we are excited to be here. It's always a good time to be in the house of the Lord, um, whether you're in person or in your couch, right? Uh, you can still have community. Um, and we really believe that, that you guys that join us online every single week are a part of our church, and we thank you for that. Um, and we want to take care of you and serve you just like we serve our church body as a whole here. But uh, man, we're excited. Today, we're going to wrap up our series just for today. Um, it's going to be the last part of this series, um, and I'm going to talk about the last two habits. Um, and so if you guys are like, man, I have no idea what you're talking about, I'll catch you up in just a second, all right? Um, but I'm excited to share that. One quick thing that I wanted to make note of before we get into it. Next Sunday, um, June 20th, is Father's Day, right? And we are going to have a service at the lake, right? So we're going to have worship at Hag Lake, um, and so that's going to be a one-shot deal at 10 a.m. We're going to do worship at the lake, um, and so if you follow us on social media, um, on our website or Instagram or Facebook, we can get more details for you. If you just, if you don't do any of those things, and you're like, man, I still don't, I still don't know what's going on. I need some help. Please call the office, and we'll talk you through it, and we'll get you all the information you could possibly need, um, but basically, we're going to go out there. We're going to have church at 10 o'clock, and then we're going to have, we're going to eat right? Because everybody like, that's like, that's old school Pentecost, right? Mm -hmm. Like you got to serve, you got to have service and then eat food, right? So we're going to do that. Um, and it's going to be a great time uh, together. But before we get started today, I, I have a couple of books. Um, and, and the first book I want to give away to anybody that's uh, watching online. If you just comment in the box now, if you're quick, then you would do it, right? So you'd already have commented beforehand because we've done it before. But if you're watching online, you comment on there. We'll follow that. Um, and we'll send this book out to you. Um, as far as in person, I didn't really know how to give it away. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn around, close my eyes. I'm going to throw it. All right. You guys ready? You guys have all been to a wedding, right? Where they like throw the bouquet. Here we go. Ready? Want? No, I'm definitely not going to do that. I'm definitely not. I want to. There you go. Right there. Thank you. See, that's how you give books away. Thank you. Um, we are not we are not Mark Batterson's Batterson's spokesperson, nor do we get money from him or anything like that. Um, we just believe he's a wonderful brother and Lord and pastor in Washington D.C. And this book has meaning because God inspired it, um, and so we just want to make sure we get that um, into people's hands. And uh, and and so that's a fun a fun way to do that. So Don, thank you for being Johnny on the spot, ready. I like that. It's so, it's my I'll just be honest with you. It's my worst nightmare to figure out how am I going to give this away. Right? Even with kids, you know, because kids are like, I didn't get one. You know, and you think like adults grow out of that. They don't. <laughs> adults are like, I didn't get one. They gave some. To, you know, so I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get people upset because I didn't give them the book. So thank you so much for helping me out. Um, now, this morning, I'm gonna, we're going to finish the series, like I said, and we're going to continue to talk about imagining unborn tomorrows. Um, this is an exciting part for me because I love to dream. I love to look forward. I love to see and think about what's coming next. Um, but here's something about me that, that might be different than you, and what maybe you relate to me in this. I, I, I like to dream, but I struggle with creativity sometimes, right? So I'm not like a creative person. You think, well, like you, you do music and stuff like that. Yeah, but that's because somebody like showed me how to do it, right? I'm just like figuring it out. I don't, I don't create things or, or figure that out real well. And so when I get to these imagining unborn tomorrows, I'm like, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to the future and I'm, I'm ready for it and I'm excited for it, but like, I, like, what do I want to do? Or like, what, what should I be excited for, right? Um, and so this isn't necessarily about landing at a destination, right? It's not necessarily about saying, well, we're going to, this morning we're going we're gonna to drill down and then by the time you walk out this morning, you're going to have all these life goals figured out and then you're just going to be able to pursue that and you're going to go after it, um, I don't think so, right? I, I just don't see that as part of it. But what I do hope to do is put tools in your hands to begin to help you do things on the daily that will help you to develop and imagine those unborn tomorrows, right? And that's what I'm going to speak from my experience um, as walking through this first. If you weren't a part of this or you haven't been a part of this series, I want to really quickly catch you up on the habits that we've been talking about for you guys that have, have heard all the sermons and have checked your Sunday school and Sunday attendance boxes every week, good for you. Um, but we're going to go through it again just really quickly. So Deanna, we're going to rapid fire through these. I'm not going to read the little, the little subscript part. Um, the first habit is flipping the script, right, where we, we take and we look 
and bury our dead yesterdays, and a lot of times we talk and tell ourselves the wrong thing here, right, when we look back. And so we need to flip the script and tell ourselves what God believes about, about it. It's not rewriting history. It's not rewriting what happened to you in the past, um, but it's about the way you look at what happened to your past. Secondly was the kiss the way, right? When we get in, when we get in tough times, we got to embrace it. We got to kiss the way. We can't, we can't hope to avoid it or, or maybe let it take us under, right? We have to kiss the way. The third habit that we talked about, and like I said, I'm firing through these, but if you want more uh, detail, I can get them to you later. The third habit, which might be my favorite, is eat the frog. We say this often at our house, that if you have, to, if you have a challenging task or, or the way to start your day would be to wake up and eat the frog. Do the toughest thing first, right? That gets that momentum going, that ball rolling. Uh, the, the fourth one is fly the kite. Right? Sometimes we just have to try things. Right? We've got to fly the kite. And, and some of you guys that have heard the messages, you, you're getting the analogies tied in. And if you haven't, good news. Um, we're going to have all these messages loaded up onto our YouTube channel that you can come back and, and follow those and watch those so that you can make sense of some of this stuff. Because right? it's kind of weird and you just throw these terms out. And you're like, what in the world is that? Right? But the next one, last week, Pastor Doug talked about cut the rope and how playing it safe is risky. And uh, sometimes that's the, that is the first step, right, in our, in our journey towards imagining un- unborn tomorrows is that we would be able to say, I'm going to take a God-sized risk. I'm going to take a, a risk that, that God is leading me to, right? It's not being risky, but it's taking a risk that God's leading you to. Um, and then this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, winding the clock and seeding the clouds. And so I'm not going to talk much about those because, you know, then you guys wouldn't hang with me for another 20 minutes or so. Um, so... Uh, we're going to talk about those two this morning, and I'm excited to, sh- to, to wrap this up and talk about winding the clock and seeding the clouds. So I want to jump right into that first one, um, winding the clock. This is the habit um, that, that is in the imagining unborn tomorrow. So this is something that we need to do as we look forward on the daily basis, right? Just want to throw a reminder out there. When we talk about these habits, the title of the book is Win the Day. Our series is called Just for, the, Just for Today. Um, but it's basically saying we live in day, day tight compartments, we have 24 hours, and what are we going to do with today, right? And we've been asking this question to you over and over and over again to challenge and motivate you, can you do it for today, or could you do it for a day, right? And so here's another practical step on how we do these things on the daily when we imagine our unborn tomorrows. This, is, this one is called Wind the Clock, and this clock um, just, you don't have to, I won't, I won't call on you or test you whether you know this or not. So if you want a history clock, and it's designed by Carlo Franzoni in 1819, right? So this thing's a, a lot of years old, 200 plus, right? And so he designed this out of marble and, and he, he fashioned it. And it's actually, it's a, it's an angel with a tablet and she's writing and there's a, she's on a chariot, right? And the chariot's wheel is the clock there. That's why it's called the car of history, and the clockwork was actually added by Simon Willard in 1837. So it's actually a, a, a combination of two artists' work. Um, so it was just a chariot wheel of marble, and then Simon Willard came and, and cut out that awesome clockwork in there. And this piece hung for a long time right above the Hall of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., right? And so these, these senators, or, or these uh, House of Representatives, these people that represented America and, and all this, the states that they represented had to walk under this and be reminded of this thing, this car of history clock, um, as they went into their meetings, right, and their discussions and their deliberations. And um, I think, like, what's, yeah, that's kind of cool. You know, like, I've been to Washington, D.C. There's lots to see. You know what I mean? There, there's lots of artwork. There's lots of things. Um, and, and so this one, I don't know if that would have really stick out to me, right? I'm like, yeah, I don't know, that's cool whatever, you know, not my thing. Um, But I do find this interesting because it's now in the National uh, Statuary Hall where it's like, uh, it's basically remembrances of old history, right? So that's where that's at now. But um, David McCullough was a historian, the Pulitzer Prize winner. And he was addressing the House of Representatives and he pointed, while he was in the hall, he pointed at this clock and said to the the people in that meeting, he said it about, about this, it is a clock with two hands and an old-fashioned face, the kind that shows what time it is now, what time it used to be, and what time it will become. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. 
And when I, when I read that quote and I looked at this piece, I thought, well, I don't know if I've ever actually looked at time, a piece of cl- a clock like that, that represents what time it used to be, what time it is now, and then what time it's going to be. I was like, man, I wish I was as smart as that guy. And I could say cool stuff like that, and people would be like, wow, deep, man, you know? <laughs> but I was, I was looking at that, and I was like, what a great reminder of that, and thinking about our current clocks, the, the one that I'm looking at on the back wall, the one that I opened this watch up, right? It's all now, right? There are old school watches, and I have a few. I'm you know, a little, a little secret. I like to collect watches, all right? But so I have plenty of watch face hand style watches, but a lot of our clocks are digital readout, and that's because we live in a now culture. We just need to know what time it is now, right? I don't, I'm not really concerned about what happened in the past, and I'm not even really, you know, capable of looking to the future. Maybe I'm too busy, or maybe I don't care, or maybe I, you know, whatever, but I just need to know what's now, right? And, and I've talked about this before, so I won't belabor the point, but we've gotten incredibly lazy to the point where our, all, we need satisfaction immediately that when we go to a fast food restaurant, we can't even wait because we have to order ahead now so that when I show up, it's ready. You know what I mean? Like that four minutes that you're going to wait for that ridiculous burger was going to, I'm sorry, fast food is not that good, all right? If it's your thing, whatever. But, you know, like if, if I couldn't wait in the lobby for four minutes, now I got to order ahead because I got to have it now and it's got to be right here, you know? And that's the culture that we live in. And this is the problem. If we don't, if we don't wind the clock, meaning if we don't, rep, if we don't, you know, see that relationship of past, the present, and the future, then we might miss something. It's good to live in the now, man. Like, like we titled the series just for today because, look, can you do it for a day? That's good principle, right? It's good thought. It, it helps people, okay? I can, I can give you numerous, numerous names of people that have used that principle to recover from life-controlling problems, okay? It's good. It's good stuff. But we can't be stuck just in that one spot where it's just all now. We have to look and appreciate and see the past, understand what's happening in the present, but also to look forward in the future. Now look, as Christians, and this is the part that I get excited when and cool things like, well, it's a two-handed face. With an eye. And I always imagine he had a cool, great quote. He probably didn't. Maybe he wasn't even a good speaker. But, you know, I, I always think we could, we could try and flip these things out there but I want to break it down to the most simple part and what it means to us today. And Mark Batterson in his book says that it is keeping, when it comes to our spiritual walk, winding the clock means that we're keeping one eye on eternity and the other eye on opportunity. It's a great quote. It's a great quote. Here's why. Because spiritual disciplines, hear me on this, spiritual disciplines are the pathway from living a life that you control or you own and you try and manufacture and make and submitting your care and control or submitting your will to the care and control of Christ. That middle piece is the spiritual discipline. It's the winding the clock. It's the doing the things every day, right? And a lot of times we miss that because we don't want to look back or we don't want to look forward or we're too caught up in the now. But every single day, we have, to, we, have, we have to not find time, right? Because you're not going to find it. You won't find time in our schedule, but you have to make time in your spiritual disciplines, right? So if you ever thought that I was ever going to get through a message without talking about reading your Bible and praying, you're wrong, all right? Because here's why. Everything we know about God, we know from this book. Think about it. Think about it. We, I mean, yeah, we've had great eyewitness testimony and we've had other literature and we've had commentaries and we've had all these things that have given us a breadth of knowledge but everything that we know about God has been inspired from him in his inerrant word so why in the world would we try and live and follow after a God when we don't even read what he's all about that's silly to me right and yet here's what we do too often I'm saying you notice I'm saying we and not you 
I'm saying here's what we do too often is we, we want to like wake up and read our Bible in the morning because, man, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And I'm going to have a coffee and it's going to be this serene thing. And then we do it maybe once. <laughs> to be honest with you, right? I'm just being real. Maybe you're like, well, I'm not a morning person, so right as soon as I, you know, eat my dinner and settle in for the night, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to read a chapter a day, I'm going to read through this thing in the year, and then we find ourselves thinking, why am I still on, still on day four and it's June, you know, <laughs> right? It's the spiritual discipline that it takes to every day wind the clock and say, listen, I'm not going to be stuck in the past, I'm going to be aware of the present, and I'm going to look towards eternity with the eye on the opportunity in the future, but I have to do that daily with my spiritual disciplines, and I'll tell you why, because there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. You know, here's the key. I wish that I could tell you that I, I, I read my Bible, you know, four chapters a day and all that stuff. I'm going to be honest with you. I do read my Bible almost every day. I don't always read a lot, <laughs> Right? I pray every day. I don't always pray a lot, but I know that I can get better. And here's why. If I try and do this on my own, I for sure will fail. I promise you that. And if you try and do it on your own, you're just like, well, I'm just going to determine to myself that I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to read my Bible, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get closer to God. You'll fail. And here's why. Here's the key. John chapter 14, Jesus says that I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to be, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, then at that point, we begin, we begin to see things and hear things from God, right? Not in this weird way, but in a, in a deep spiritual way. And we begin to lean into the nudgings and the urgings of the Holy Spirit. And we begin to get hungry for that stuff because we want to know more, right? We want to know what God has for us. We want to follow God, right? And so when we have that Holy Spirit living inside of us, we're no longer just a whitewashed tomb, right? That's what Jesus called the Pharisees. That's what he was picking on him, right? He was saying, look, these guys look pretty on the outside, but there's nothing going on on the inside. We're a body that is filled with the Holy Spirit. We're grafted into his family, like we just sang, as God's children. And that drives us, and that gives us a hunger to say, God, I want to know more about you. God, I want to take this person to prayer, and I want to take this issue to prayer. And I want to thank you for this, and I want to thank you for that. And that begins the path on the spiritual discipline. And I ask you this question, can you do it for today? Person, um, I, maybe you guys, maybe you, there's some chemists in the house or super scientists, um, and you've, we all know this name when I say it. I, like I said, I don't, um, but it's super interesting. Chemist Vincent Schaefer was a researcher at GE Research Laboratory, right? And he would take GE's freezers. This is in the 40s, all right? This is cool stuff. He would take GE's freezer, and he would create that, that environment, and then he would inject He'd take his breath, right, and he'd into the freezer. And then while he was doing that, he would inject different chemical substances into his breath, all in hopes to see if he could seed the clouds to make it rain. I'm like, man, what kind of person are you? What do you wake up and like, you know, like the rain's not good enough? You're like, I want to see if I can make it rain. <laughs> you know what I mean? And not in that way, right? But, and, and so he, he says, okay, I'm going to do this. And he finally finds this this method that he seems to be working. And so on November 13th, 1946, he gets into a single prop plane with six pounds of dry ice. Those of you guys that know more about science, maybe you're like, well, this is how it works, you know? Um, and you can Google that and find out how it works. Feel free. Um, but he gets six pounds of dry ice with some of his chemical substances stuff, gets in a single prop plane, flies out of, ready? Schenectady County Airport. And then he flies into a cumulus cloud and drops his dry ice. And you know what happens? It rains. He's got a clear day. Cumulus clouds are the white fluffy ones, right? You know, like they're not the rain clouds. They're not the ones that we see almost every day in Oregon, right? And he flies into those things, drops the dry ice, and the people say it's awesome. The, the newspaper, the clip of... This, one, this experience, the, well, the experiment, I mean, when they saw it, the newspaper heading was Chemist Vincent, Sch <laughs> Kim and, Chemist Vincent Schaefer makes it, makes it snow today. Tomorrow he walks on water. <laughs> right? right? 
Because in 1946, it's so amazing that somebody would think to do that. You think like, well, all right, what is that? What does that have to do with us? What does it have to do with spiritual walk? I'm not here for good advice. There's plenty of tech, TED Talks online, right? There's plenty of Tony Robbins DVDs that you can buy somewhere and help your life, okay? I'm sure of it. Podcasts are free nowadays. But see, we come and we gather together, not so that a sage on the stage can give you some kind of wisdom, but so that we can grow in the Lord together. And I believe that he is doing something in our hearts and our lives this week, this morning, right now. Here's why. Because seeding the clouds, when it comes to our spiritual disciplines, seeding the clouds means sowing today what you hope to see tomorrow. How do we do that? There's one thing that we do as Christians and believers in Jesus that legitimately that probably nobody else does. We pray to the God of the Bible. The God of Isaac and Jacob. The God of Abraham, right? The creator. There's a special sense there, and I, and I don't, I don't want to rush through this part. Because here's what often happens. The pastor starts talking about prayer. You start feeling like, yeah, I probably should do more of that. And then maybe you pray at lunch today because, hey, you did it this time, you know. I did it just for today. But I hope if I just take a minute to explain this Maybe you followed Jesus for 50 years. Maybe you just followed him today. This morning you're like, you know what, I'm going I'm to try this out. Here's the benefit. Here's the coolest thing that I could ever think of. That the God that created the universe, the God that sets galaxies into motion, the God that tells the ocean how far to go, how the animals are supposed to look, how many breaths we're supposed to take in a day, how all the intricate parts of our body are supposed to work, that God wants to conversate, have a conversation with you. Think about it for a minute. And yet, it's, we're too busy, man. We got to get, get somewhere and go somewhere and do something. Listen, I'll tell you, if you start seeding the clouds with prayer, and you start entering into that conversation with the Creator God, we sing songs all the time that call him Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. We, say, we sing all these, God, God, he's a good, good father, right? We sing all these things about him, but are you talking to him? Is your heart talking to him? I'm not just saying some rote, like, prayer that you, that you figured out and that you said since you were a kid. Does God hear from your heart on a regular basis? Because there's a storm coming. Listen, when we see the clouds, we're hoping and praying prayerfully today what we hope to see in the future, right? Maybe you're walking through something in your marriage this morning. Pray about it. Begin to seed the cloud today. Maybe you're walking through something with one of your kids, and they're after you. They're, they, you know, you guys are at odds or whatever. Start praying about it. Start praying for them. Start seeding the clouds now. Start, start speaking to God about your depression. Start speaking to God about your finances. Start speaking to God about your physical and your emotional and your, your, your health, all of it. Start to surrender that to the Lord every single day. Find the time you're not going to find it. Make it. Say, I am going to do this today. I'm going to spend a few moments. Don't, don't bite off too much, right? Don't try and eat the whole pie. It's too sweet, right? Get a little slice and say, hey, I'm going to start today and I'm going to have a conversation with the Heavenly Father. Yeah. And this is what's crazy, guys. This is what's crazy to me. That as soon as I say, Jesus, he's listening. Yeah. Guess what? Even before I bring my need to him, yeah. he knows it. He's waiting for us to seed the clouds. I'm going to fire some scripture with you because I want you to show you the importance and the power of prayer. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, To pray without ceasing. 
Ephesians 6.18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 2 Chronicles 7.14. And tell me if this doesn't ring true for us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Ladies and gentlemen, power in prayer. We have to begin to say every day I'm going to seed the clouds for what I hope to see God do tomorrow. Man, (laughs) there's a storm coming. I want to finish our time this morning with these last five or six minutes with one of my favorite guys outside of Jesus in the Bible. I like them all, but I always find myself back in 1 Kings when we see Elijah the Tishbite. Probably because I like saying that, you know, like Tishbite, you know, like kind of neat. You imagine going around telling people that, <laughs> you know, like I'm Travis the Tishbite, you know, like, excuse me, <laughs> right? But Elijah, Elijah's a prophet that God has sent to this this day and age, right? And we we pick it up in First Kings 17 because when we wind the clock and we see the clouds, there's a storm coming. You guys catching something? There's a, there's, a, there's a theme here. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the prophet Elijah, he comes and he says, yes, I'll do whatever you want, God. And so he go and tell the people that because they're dirty, rotten sinners, right, we're not reigning on this land. We're not having do, we're not having anything until I tell you and then you tell them. So Elijah's like, oh, that's, that's interesting, <laughs> right? Like if God told me that, I'd be like, I think I need to sleep on it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't know. But Elijah's like, okay, I'm the prophet. God, I'm your spokesperson. So he tells them that. And then obviously that irritates them, right? <laughs> like they're like, hey, who are you to tell us, right? King Ahab and these guys are like, I'm in charge, not you, punk, right? And so the God says, hey, I need you to go over by the Jordan. There's a brook there, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed you morning and night by the ravens, and then you can drink out of the brook. Here's what I like. I want to point out in 1 Kings 5, this is exactly what Elijah, what it says about Elijah. So he did what the Lord had told him. And the brook dries up. And so God says, hey, I I need you to, you know, this is no longer going to be your provision for now. I need you to go over to Zarephath and you're going to find a widow there with her son. And I need you to just go in there and just be with her for a while. And so 1 Kings 17, 10 said, so he went to Zarephath. So he gets there, right? And she's like cooking up her last meal. And she's like, well, I'm going to pour this in here and I'm going to pour this in here and then we're going to eat and we're going to die. Yay, you know? That's what drought does in desert air climate like that, right? You know, you can't make it. And so God performs a miracle through Elijah. And Elijah, right, we, and, and maybe you've read the story, but maybe you haven't. It's in 1 Kings 17 and 18, you'll find this. But God provides a miracle, and he provides enough food for them. Not just for that meal, but continually. And so the time goes on, and, and Elijah's hanging out there, and the widow's son dies. And the widow is torn up. Because it's all she had, right? That's it. Her son, her boy was it. And so she goes to Elijah and says, surely you're a man of God. And I, and I know you can do something about this. And so Elijah says, yeah, her, let, me, let me pray about it. And so he prays about it. And God picks the child up and breathes life back into him. And he comes back to life for the widow at Zarephath. Pretty cool stuff. Then God instructs Elijah after that. He says, hey, I need you to go to King Ahab and let him know that you're going to defeat the prophets of Baal. They're like, oh my goodness, man. You know, like if I was Elijah, I was like, can I just like find a pool? You know, like can I chill out for a minute? (laughs) You know, but he's like, okay. So he goes to King Ahab. He says, hey, listen, all you guys are worshiping the prophets of Baal. And that's like a mother, like an earth worship, right? It's like, never mind. We don't have time to get into that. So they're worshiping the earth like it is their God. And he says, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. And, and so he's like, well, 
I, you know, I want to see what you got, King Ahab. You know, I want to see what you got. So Elijah says, okay, send all your, you know, 450 prophets of Baal and, and send them out to Carmel. I'll meet them there. Right? And, and that's a great story in itself. That's a half an hour or more worth of digging into that part. But the short story is the prophets try and try and try. They fail. And Elijah steps up and in 70 some words, he prays and God brings fire. That's amazing. Elijah knew that the storm was coming, so he was winding the clock and seeding the clouds. Right? I want to pick it up right after that in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41 through 46. This is right after he, God brings down fire. All the people around are like, the God, of, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's the God. This Baal stuff is nonsense. If you're children in here, you're, you can cover your earmuffs, whatever, but he says, go grab the prophets of Baal, take them to the thing and slaughter them, you know? And so he, he killed all the prophets of Baal, so they're gone. And then he picks it up right here in verse 41, and Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is a sound of heavy rain. Come on, somebody. We're in a three and a half year famine. And Elijah has the guts to go to the king and say, hey, go eat and drink, man. Go, go take care of yourself because, yeah, there's a storm coming. Are you kidding me? So he goes, he says, so Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down on the ground and put his face between his knees. I'm going to stop right there and guess that's not the only time he'd ever done that. I'm going to guess that Elijah actually wound the clock and seeded the clouds day in and day out while he ate from the brook, from the ravens at the brook, while he stayed with a widow at Zarephath, while he encountered and conquered through God's power the prophets of Baal and challenged the king of the known land. I guarantee you that's not the first time that he found himself face down before the Lord saying, God, we need some rain now. Pick it up. He says, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. <laughs> Seven times. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. <laughs> the storm coming. And Elijah knew it. He knew it because he'd prayed for it. He knew it because he wound the clock, he seated the clouds, he did the daily discipline. He listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Right? You guys are like, well, I, hey, I thought the Holy Spirit didn't come and, you know, until late. Listen, the Holy Spirit was very, very present in the Old Testament. Right? He actually led the people of Israel by a cloud and by a pillar of fire, yeah. right? He was there, and he spoke that still, small voice, and he gave Elijah the confidence and the courage. And so he said, Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. <laughs> Come on. A cloud the size of a, a man's fist is over the sea, and he's like, dude, you better get going. Like, this thing is coming today. Right? And so then it says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. There's a storm coming. See, a lot of times, I started saying that earlier, and you guys were thinking like, yeah, God's preparing us for these bad times. He probably is but God is also preparing you for a miracle. Because sometimes that storm, sometimes that, that cloud that's the size of a man's fist that's rising out of the ocean is your answer to prayer. It's every night praying for my Aunt Jenny that I can remember. And then when I was 14 years old, she calls my grandma and says, 
I'm 80-something years old. I don't remember how old she was. I'm going to surrender my life to Christ. That's a small cloud rising over the sea. But it takes that discipline, right? I'm not special. You're not special. When we pray, it's not like God goes, oh, well, shoot, Travis is praying. (laughs) Right? God's willingness and his ability is always there. It's our readiness that holds us back most of the time. It's our ability, it's, it's not our ability, but it's our want to. It's our engaging in that relationship with him. <clears throat> God is not, God is sovereign. He's going to move. His hand is going to do what his hand is going to do. But ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you something this morning? God moves on the behalf of those who pray. I've seen it. God healed me in a way that I, that I can't share. And as the worship team comes forward, and we're going to wrap this time up. There's so many stories that I could tell you about how we, my family or myself or people like you, that I've heard your stories where you've seeded the clouds. You've prayed on a daily basis for a relative, a family member. You've asked God to deliver you from something. You've asked God to heal something. And you've seen it happen. I've lived it way more than once. And it's not because I just one time found myself with my head between my knees and face down because I grabbed that lifeline and said, oh yeah, that God up there, hey, would you help me? It's because I decided a long time ago that I was going to follow Jesus. And I decided that his word was good enough for me. And I decided that that conversation between him and I is important enough. And so I began to wind the clock and seed the clouds and run it back and run it back and run it back, knowing that there's a storm coming, knowing that when I need healing, there's a cloud rising out of the sea because God hears me and the prayer of righteous people is powerful and effective. I pointed out this one thing because I wanted you to see all this. We talked about seven habits and, and... You know, all these things. And I want to wrap it up with this. If you don't surrender your will to the care and control of Christ, I'm going to use a word that might offend you. If you don't, then this is just a good TED talk. This is just a whole other book that some obey God. Think about when we obey It's way more than just seven daily habits. It's way more than just a talk around thing. It becomes a lifestyle and there's a storm coming. And we need to be prepared for that. Whether that's a challenging time that God's going to walk us through, like we sang earlier, that he's going to split the sea and we're going to walk right through it. Or maybe it's going to be the biggest miracle that you and your family have ever seen. But there's a storm coming. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can have a relationship with you through your word and through our prayers. Thank you that we don't have to be a special person. We don't have to have a special word. But God, that we can open our hearts to you and say, God, we need to see that cloud rise over the sea. It's been a long time But God, I trust your timing. And so God, I pray for every single need in this room and online in our church body and our church family. Lord, in our community, I pray that those needs, as you hear them and as we become a people who are gonna be righteous people that pray effectively and powerful, then God, you would hear that and your willingness and your ability would shine in our community. Lord, you would heal our hearts and heal our land and we would turn from our wicked ways as we surrender to you. God, help us in that journey. Give us your Holy Spirit to nudge us and to poke us every on the daily, Lord God, to speak to us and to guide us. That our will would become yours, God, and and our plans would become, your, your plans would become our plans, God, and we would follow after you with everything that we have. And that we would know that you're there, that you're listening, that you're providing. And we say yes to you this morning. If you're in this room or you're joining us online and you've never had an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, you've never said, hey, I don't, I don't follow that kind of God. I don't, I don't know him. He's my personal Lord and Savior. Then I want to invite you to accept him this morning. It's really easy. You just admit that, you know, hey, I messed up. You confess your sin before him and you believe in Jesus.
And the Bible says that you're saved when we pray that, pray that prayer. So if that's you this morning, I ask you just pray that prayer. Say, God, I, I, I admit and I know that you're real. cloud to rise, Lord God, whether it's a miracle in their finances or their marriage or their physical health or their relationships, God, they need that storm, they need that rain, so God, we just pray right now, we see the clouds right now for prayerfully what we hope to see tomorrow, and God, I pray that you would help us to keep one eye on eternity and the other eye on the opportunities that we have to serve and know you, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. And uh, we're going we're gonna to go out singing, um, and, and I asked them to sing this song in a little different way. So feel free to hang out and, and sing this song, or if you like, hey, I got to go right now, or if you just want to get up and walk around, that's fine. Uh, but let's just turn this into a, a piece of worship here uh, while we digest that. Thanks for being here with us this morning. Um, thanks for joining us. And remember, next week, we're doing worship.